But hey, Rock Church annual community, so glad you could join us today. My name is Nate, and I have the honor of serving as one of the pastors here at The Rock. Uh, we are so excited for today because we're giving you a preview of our upcoming series, Heart for the House. And so we really encourage you to not only share this with a friend or maybe even invite some people over to join in service together, but we want you to join us afterwards because we're gonna be sitting with some of our friends here and we're gonna be talking about how this house, The Rock Church, has impacted our lives. So hey, stay tuned and we'll see you after the service. Wave your hands in the air. Okay, Lord, thank you. We surrender to you. We take this moment to acknowledge that you are going to speak to us. And even though the guy on the stage has an audible voice, we pray for your inaudible voice to speak in our heart something way more profound than whatever I'm going to say. In Jesus' name, amen. Give high five someone next to you. Amen. <clears throat> time is it? Turn to Genesis chapter 3, please. Genesis chapter 3. I mentioned um, that this sermon is 35 years old. Uh, sermons and revelation happens over time. And there are some sermons that are very special to me and to every preacher. They have their favorites. And I want to share something with you that really God birth out of a question I had um, about 35 years ago. And the question was, what is the devil's number one weapon? It's a very simple question. I remember sitting in my house asking that question. Um, years ago, I was, when I was a youth pastor, I was um, driving to New Jersey, or, or uh, Pennsylvania, and I heard that the devil was having a swap meet. We call the flea market, uh, swap meet flea market. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Okay, and it was all these little things. So people selling stuff. So I heard us, I, I went, and it was at the Philadelphia uh, Veterans Stadium where the Philadelphia Eagles played football. My brother actually was drafted by them in 1987. He was a quarterback. And I, when I got there, there was traffic from New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, tri-state area. Well, tri-state is not for Pennsylvania, but at the, at the area. Cars lined up, trucks, pickup trucks, station wagons, if you remember what a station wagon was. Does anybody not know what a station wagon is? <laughs> you don't know what a station wagon is? It, it, it looks like a hearse, but it's really a car, right? <laughs> and when I got to the, to, the, to the stadium, all around the stadium in the parking lot were these booths, and these demons were standing behind them, and they were giving stuff away, drugs and uh, it's terrorist paraphernalia, disease, all these things designed to destroy your life. And in the middle of the parking lot was a stadium, and the stadium had signs on all the doors that said, no admittance, Satan only, no admittance, Satan only. So I'm walking around the parking lot watching these demons give away all this stuff to these people. They were putting it in their cars, and these demons like six, seven feet tall, stuff dripping from them. It was just it was nasty. And in the middle of the parking lot was a stadium that said, no admittance, Satan only. And on top of the stadium was the devil. And I said, devil, what are you doing? He said, oh, man, I'm destroying all these people's lives. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, all the stuff that I'm giving away, it's all for free. Some of it you have to buy. It's all designed to destroy their life. The devil will charge you money. Let me say it this way. You will pay money for stuff the devil intends to destroy your life with. The devil's so good that you do pay money for stuff that destroys your life. So he's telling me all this. I'm like, well, what is in this, in the stadium? How come it's locked? He said, well, what I have in the stadium is my number one weapon. I said, what do you mean? He says, well, I can't force anybody to do anything I want them to do. I can only trick them. And what I use to trick them is my number one weapon. I said, well, well, he says, listen, I can't force you. So my number one weapon I use on every single person, every single day, all day. That's how I get them to sin. The devil gets you and I to sin by using his number one weapon on us. And I said, well, what is it? He says, I'm not going to tell you because if I tell you, you could beat me out of my own game. I said, well, I'm going to read the Bible and I know I'm going to find it in the Bible. And that's where this sermon came. And I read Genesis 1, Genesis 2, true story. This is, no, I say true story. The, the, the demon on top of the building is not true, okay? <laughs> 
But it's true from this point. I asked this God this question. What is the devil's number one weapon? He said, read the Bible. I started reading the Bible. Genesis chapter 3. Here's the devil's number one weapon. Is that you can be your own God and decide good and evil. And that sin has no consequence. Every time you sin, you believe I can get away with it and I can make my own decision. But the truth is, it's a lie. Let's read the story. Genesis chapter 3. Genesis 1 and 2, God created the heavens and the earth. He created the fish, the birds, the bees, and all that kind of stuff. He created the, 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 the stars and the galaxies, etc. And by the way, the Bible says that he opens up the heavens like a curtain, and scientists will tell you that the heavens are expanding at the speed of light. Ironically enough, that God is opening up the heavens at the speed of light, like that, 186,000 miles per second. Now, and then he created man, and he created woman, and put him in the Garden of Eden, and he said, tend to keep, and he said, don't eat from that tree. If you eat from that tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall die. We talk, looked about this last week if you were here. And now we're going to pick it up in Genesis chapter 3. Look what it says. It says, the serpent was more cunning than any beast of field which the field the, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Now, the devil is more cunning deceitful than any beast of field the Lord God had made. That means he's smarter than you and me. You have to understand the devil is slick. He can deceive you so much so that you can look in the mirror and do something that you know is no good for you, much less the stuff you don't know is no good for you. When I used to do, I did cocaine for, for two years. Did, did smoke weed for eight years. And I remember being in my apartment on 4929 Callwood Boulevard, right down the street from San Diego State, looking in the mirror and saying, this is not good for you, and then doing cocaine. I remember saying that out loud with my mouth. Why are you doing this? You're destroying your life. And I did it anyway. Why? Because right there, devil's was number one weapon. Look what it said. Look at the devil's names. He's a destroyer. He is never going to build into your life. He's only going to destroy your life. Now, he's not going to tell you that he's doing that, but that's what he is. That's his character. That's his name. His name is murderer. Not only does he murder people, and actually the father of murder, murder and, and death, but he murders your dreams. He murders your opportunities. He murders your perception of who you are. He kills stuff. He comes to kill, steal, and destroy. He's an accuser. All day and night, God, the, before God, we, we looked like last week, Revelation, that the, the accuser who accuses the brethren before God day and night, before day and night, God is accusing you before God, uh, accusing before God. How many of you by a show of hands know that there's 20 things God, the devil can accuse you of and be telling the truth? Let me say that a different way. Let me slow down because maybe I'm talking too fast. I know I get excited. If I was a devil and I knew everything about you, I'd say, hey, God, let's talk about Jimmy. How many of you know there'd be some stuff he can tell you, tell God about you that would be true? Can I get an amen? He's saying it. And he's accusing you to yourself. He's telling you how bad you are. He's telling you how much of a fail you are. He's telling you how ugly you are. He's telling you how much you, you didn't stick to your discipline. All day and night. Why? To beat you down. Why? To make you more susceptible to his weapon. Why? So you can deny the God who created you and loves you. Look at the names. He's in a thief. He'll steal every opportunity God has given you. A liar. He is the master and the father of lies. He's the master of deception. And deception is not, hey, I didn't steal the money and you did. Deception is not, I have only $100 in my pocket when you have two. That's, that's a lie. But here's the bigger lie. I present myself to you as someone who I'm not. I'm going to be a faithful husband, and you're not. I'm going to be a faithful wife, and you're not. I'm going to be a great employee, and you're not. I'm going to be a great friend, and you're not. That's deception. That's a lie. The Bible says that the, the demons can transform themselves into an angel of light. That's what he teaches us to do. We have a demonic spirit or a selfish spirit or an arrogant spirit or a prideful spirit, yet we present ourselves as this angel of light. That's the fall of lies. This, 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 this relationship we have with ourself and God and the devil is so spiritual and so this can be so deceptive because the devil blinds us 
because we let him. Last week we saw we make agreements with the devil. When we tell the devil, God, or, 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 or the devil, listen, I want to do what you want to do. And hear how it is couched. I want to do what I want to do. That's the devil talking to you. Why? Because you're either for God or against God. You're for God and against the devil or you're for the devil and against God. Those are your only two options. There's no in between. There's no third option. So look what it says. It says, the woman said, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat nor shall you touch lest you die. Go back to point number one, please. Here is the devil's number one weapon. Go back to point one. Sin has no consequence. Is that when the devil told Eve, you will not die. In other words, God told you if you eat from that tree, you will not die. I'm telling you, you won't. You come to church and hear the pastor say, don't watch pornography, it's not good for you. And the devil says, oh no, it's good for you. It won't hurt me. I did a whole sermon on this called X-Men. Because if you, there's certain things that if you do, you will be someone's ex. And I'm not going to get into it because there's a whole sermon on this, but I did the whole sermon on how pornography and really sex, sex in general, how it shapes your brain and how if you are too unfaithful, when I say too unfaithful, multiple times in the flesh or if you watch pornography over and over again, your brain will actually rewire itself and it will hinder your ability to bond intimately with a woman, with a person. But the devil's not going to tell you that. The devil's just going to tell you, hey, let's get a quick, a quick thrill. He's not telling you what's really happening to you. He's a deceiver. You smoke weed. I smoked weed for eight years, the whole eight years. I'm thinking, oh, it's not a big deal, it's no big deal. Realized, not realizing how many brain cells I was destroying in my mind, how many opportunities I was destroying in my life. I look back on my life, how many years, decades of my life, and I only did it for eight years, but it had implications of other things in my life, wasted. And the, the wasted time and energy that I spent in my young years doing that, how I could have been doing something else. And when you, when you take a wrong turn, and do one degree off today, five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, here's you end up over here where you should be over here. The devil is so smart. So when he tells you it's not going to bother you, and you think, well, I'm, I woke up, I'm okay. You just took a, a right turn where you should have taken a left. He's very, very slick. Not only that, not only does he tell you that sin has no consequence, look what else he tells you. He says, you can be like God. Give me point number two. Give me point number two. You can be like God and control your life. For God knows in a day you'll be like God knowing good and evil. We think we can decide right and wrong on our own. God doesn't want you to decide right and wrong on your own. He wants you to obey him. Two guys are walking down the street. The homeless guy sitting on the corner, and he says to the first guy, hey, can I have some, some, uh, some water? You got a bottle of water. And, and, and the, you would think the guy would say, sure, here's my water. And God says, no, no, I don't want you to give the water to him. I want the next guy because that's what I want you, for you. I, I, want, I want him to have that experience. I was in Mexico doing youth ministry with my youth group when I was a youth pastor, and we were there to give clothes to some kids and, at an orphan, orphanage through a church. So we go up to the church and, and I'm standing at the, outside the little church and this little girl comes up to me. She's like five. She has a little skirt on. It's rainy and chilly and she had no shoes on. And she's standing in mud and she said, necesito zapatos, necesito zapatos. She need, I need shoes. I need shoes. And I said, I, I got some zapatos. And, and the pastors came and said, don't give her any shoes. And I was like... Why? That's what we came down here for. We got bags of shoes and all this stuff. And one of the kids came and said, I got bags of shoes and don't give her any shoes. And so the girl went around and said, see, about those. She's asking everybody for shoes. Next thing you know, the girl goes down the street. And I go, why couldn't we give her any shoes? He says, because she's not poor. It's a scam. 
She's going to take the shoes and sell them. Now, I'm not saying that's all what happens to all the kids in this particular situation. But what happened was God was telling me at this point, here's what I want you to do. I don't want you to try to figure things out on your own. I want us, you and I, to have relationship. And so you have to understand when, when the devil says you could decide good and evil on your own, he's saying you make up your own rules for your life. You decide when you go to church. You decide how much to read the Bible. No, God, I want you to tell me. God, you tell me when you want me to pray. You tell me what my Bible reading. You tell me where I should go to church. You tell me what my, my ministry is. You tell me what my calling is. You tell me what, what money to give. You tell me how, what service to go to. That's how we need to live our life, a life of obedience. And so when the devil tells you you could do your own thing, he's trying to put you in control of your life, which is exactly what got the devil kicked out of heaven. The devil was an angel. He was given a worship angel. He was a high-ranking angel. And he says, I want to be worshiped by God. And God said, I don't think so, homie, and kicked him out of heaven. You, he's saying the same thing to you. He's trying to get you to take control over your life away from God when we are called to, to submit to God and serve God. So he told Eve, No. There is no consequence. Look at the Bible says there's a consequence. Look at Romans. Look at Romans. I'm sorry. Give me Romans chapter 3, verse 23. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Everybody's a sinner. The Bible says that all, and the penalty of sin is death. For the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ. Every single one of us has sinned, uh, has sinned and every single one of us has a penalty of death. The penalty of sin is death. Look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. Look what it says. The woman saw that the tree was good for food, pleasant to the eyes, a tree desirable to make one wise. She took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. And the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves in the presence of the Lord God among the trees in the garden. Um, let me ask you a question. How many of y'all by a show of hands or, or just say uh, yes or no? Can you hide from God? Can you hide your thoughts from God? Can you hide the intents of your heart from God? Can you hide anything you do from God? Then why do we try every single day? God can't see me. God doesn't know what I'm thinking. God doesn't know what I'm doing. I'm in the back of my seat in my car. God don't know. God don't know. He don't know what I'm looking on my phone. Oh, he knows. <coughs> Excuse me. My, my wife was pregnant. I mean, my wife was pregnant. My wife. <laughs> she was pregnant. She was pregnant. I got three kids. My wife was in labor 12 hours with our first child, 24 hours with our second, and 49 hours with our third child. Our third child was our son. We had two girls and a boy. And his head was stuck for like five hours. And when, his, when he was born, a normal kid's head is one-third their weight. Now, I don't know how much you weigh, but just cut it in third. And if your head was one-third your weight, you'd be in National Geographic. I mean, you'd be, a, you'd be like a freak, right? But little kids, one of the things that make them really cute is that they got ginormous heads and their eyes are really far apart, comparative to adults. So next time you see a little baby, just kind of like check out their head and see how big it is. That's why when you pick up a kid, you got to hold their head because their head is like, like a brick. <laughs> My son's head was like 70% of his weight. It was ginormous. And so once he started growing into it, you know, he took him you know, a couple of decades to grow into it, but once he was getting like <clears throat> 10, 11, he was still 50% or so with his weight, with his head, and we would play hide and seek in the house. <laughs> dad, dad, let's play hide and seek. Now, hide and seek in the house was we would turn all the lights off, you go hide, and then you have to scare the mess out of the person looking for you. So you hide and you, ah, right? So my, my son, dad, I'm going to play hide and seek. I was like, uh, where are you going to hide? You're going to be behind the garage or the, or the suburban. That's about it. I said, right, you go ahead and hide. I'm going to count, and I'm going to come find you. So I could hear him walking through the house, banging on the, on the hall, on the wall. Bam, bam, bam. <laughs> he hides behind a little tiny plant like this. And he's got four feet of skull over here and four feet of skull over here. 
His sister is hiding behind his head. She's <laughs> dancing around, got this big old moon crater. And so I'm walking through the house. Where's Miles? Where's Miles? And I can hear him going, he, he, he can see it. He can see it. He, he thinks because he can't see me, I can't see him. We all often think because we can't see God, he can't see what we do. We forget. Not only does he see what you do, he sees what you think. He sees the meditation of your heart, what you whisper by yourself, what you watch on your phone. He sees it all. And so Adam and Eve are like trying to hide from God. And so what I would tell you is stop hiding from God. Stop hiding from God. Stop trying to think and act like he doesn't know everything about you and the intent. You know, I always, what kills me is I hear people on TV, God knows my heart. That's the problem. <laughs> he does know your heart. And he knows what the Bible says, the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Genesis chapter 3, verse 9. It says, the Lord called to Adam and said, where are you? Oh, big question. He said, I heard your voice in the garden. I was afraid and I was naked and I hid myself. When he asked God, Adam, where he, where he is, he's not saying, are you behind that rock or you're behind that rock? He's really saying, are you at a higher stature now that you did what I told you not to do? Ask yourself, when you do the things God tells you not to do, or you don't do the things he's telling you to do, are you any better off? The devil can only pay you with death, destruction, separation from God's blessing. And so the only thing you can do is confess your sin. Is say, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I have sinned. Look what the Bible says next. It says, verse 11, the one, who told you that you were naked? <coughs> Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded that you should not? And the man said, the woman made me do it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Ladies, tell him to shut his mouth. All the ladies, older ladies say, shut your mouth. <laughs> the woman whom you gave me to be with, he gave, she gave me of the tree that I ate. And then he said to the man, who, who told you? And the man said, the devil made me do it. You cannot blame anybody but yourself. There was a guy who walked across a tightrope in Niagara Falls. It took him three hours to get across the tightrope. And when he got to the other side, he said, do y'all believe I can go back and put a wheelbarrow on top of the wire and put dirt in it and take it across without dropping any dirt? And all the people said, I believe. Say, I believe. He says, you believe? He says, okay, if you believe, he looked at this little boy, said, do you believe? And the little boy said, yes, I believe. And he says, if you believe, get in and go with me. He dumped the dirt out and said, get in and go with me. It's one thing to come to church. It's another thing to even get baptized as a baby. It's a whole other thing to say, Lord, I'm getting in the wheelbarrow. The devil is, the devil is a master deceiver. And if you sat down and thought about it, which I highly encourage you to do, and say, Lord, God, show me how I am being deceived right now about my Bible reading, my involvement in the church, my financial support, my tithing my, and entrusting my finances with you, God, my prayer, my diet how much I work, my attitude, my mental, emotional, spiritual, physical health, how much is it really aligned with what you want versus what I want, which is really what the devil's telling me to do against what you want. You're either doing what God wants or you're not doing what God wants. Those are the only two options. And my encouragement to you is say, look, listen, am I subtly believing the devil's number one weapon every single day to think I know better than God for me? 
or am I willing to get in the wheelbarrow and surrender my life to Christ and say, Lord, I am going to deny and resist the devil. The Bible says if you resist the devil, he will flee. But you have to resist him. And I'm going to get in the wheelbarrow and say, Lord, I'm going to trust my life with you. Now, there are a lot of y'all who have given your life to Christ. You're still listening to the devil. You pray the prayer. You have a Bible. You come to church. You may give and all kinds of stuff. And, and that's fine. But there's still parts of your life where you have satanic agreements, which we talked about last week. I can't encourage you enough. Get that message. Listen to this message and say, I'm going to break these agreements with the devil in my life. Because the devil has convinced me to do this, and I know God doesn't really want me to do that. The devil has convinced me to cut corners here. I know God would not want me to do that. Break those agreements and do what God wants you to do. And watch what God does in your life. Watch the blessings because I bet you there are people in your life who are blessed in a way you want to be blessed. And you can't figure out why. Why are they blessed? Why does God speak to them? Why does God bless them with that opportunity? Why do they? And you can't figure it out. And it may be that in the secret place, they are doing what God wants them to do, and you are not. Had nothing to do with talent. I'm going to say it three times, then I'm going to pause for emphasis. Has nothing to do with talent, but obedience. Has nothing to do with talent. But obedience has nothing to do with talent, but obedience. God desires obedience, not sacrifice. And what that means is it's not like, oh, look what I'm doing for you, God. I don't want to hear it. God just wants you to say, God, I'm doing this out of obedience because I trust you. God blesses that. How many of y'all want to be blessed? Okay, raise your hand, elbow above the ear. Come on, church. Okay, keep your hand up just one second, just one second. Here's what I mean by blessed, that everything God has for you, you get. Come on now. And let me tell you something. You ain't going to, you can put your hands down. You ain't going to trick God into giving it to you. God's not going to say, oh, look, you came to church this month. That's awesome. You actually said a prayer this week. What a, you actually know where your Bible is. You actually saw it. You didn't open it, but you saw it. That's awesome. God's like, eh, here, let, me, let, me read my, let me read my two verses today. Okay, good, God, give me now, give me a wife. <laughs> Richard Pryor was a, a comedian. Um, he's passed away. Anybody not know who Richard Pryor is? Raise your hand if you never heard that word, Richard Pryor. Oh, man, that's, that's pretty... Uh, he, he, he was a, a, a comedian, and in one of his movies, he was praying to, uh, a, playing a, uh, a faith healer, preacher. He said, for $2, for $2, I'll heal any prayer man. Come on down for $2. And this guy starts running down with no legs and crutches. And he goes, I want to run, I want to jump, I want to dance. He says, how, how, you're asking an awful lot for $2. <laughs> Here's the thing about God's blessing, it's free. Amen. You just got to get in the wheelbarrow. You got to say, Lord, I'm, I'm yours. And then do what he says. Just do what he says. So in a minute we're going to pray. You're going to have an opportunity to get in the wheelbarrow. For some of y'all that means salvation. You never asked Christ to be your savior. But it really means getting the wheelbarrow. You don't belong to you anymore. Because you can't have cake and eat it too. You don't belong. When you get married, you don't belong to yourself anymore. This is a marriage. He's saying, Lord Jesus, I'm giving my life to you. So I'm going to ask all of you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Lord, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your goodness. And we thank you that you sent your son Jesus to die for us. Thank you that he rose from the dead. And thank you that he gave his whole life for us, that we may give our whole life to you. As our eyes are closed and our heads are bowed, if you 
want to get in that wheelbarrow and surrender your life to Jesus. I'm going to ask you to pray this prayer with me. The prayer is not magical. It's not a secret code. It's really simply you confessing that you believe you're a sinner and that Jesus died and rose from the dead for your sin. It's you surrendering your life to Jesus and getting in the wheelbarrow. So in the privacy of your heart, if you would like to surrender your life to Christ, just pray, dear God, I believe I'm a sinner and that the penalty of sin is death. But I believe Jesus loves me, that he died and rose from the dead. Jesus, please forgive me of my sin. Come live in my heart and be my savior. I believe in you and I'm getting in the wheelbarrow. I'm surrendering everything I know about myself to everything I know about you. As our eyes are closed and our heads are bowed, if you prayed that prayer, I'm going to ask you to stand up on the count of three. And by standing, you are publicly declaring that you are giving your life to Jesus. So on the count of three, stand to your feet if you prayed that prayer. One, two, three. Stand to your feet. God bless you. Well, hey, family, if you made a decision today for Christ, we want you to text SAVED to 52525. Once again, text SAVED to 52525 or visit sdrock.com slash SAVED, and we'd love to walk you through some next steps. Um, as I mentioned, we have a huge heart for this house. We love our Rock Church community and beyond. And so I have some of my friends here today. Hey. And what's up, what's up, what's up? <laughs> and I know we all have some amazing stories and just history with this church. I can go first as you guys think about um, I want to talk about like one way that this church has really impacted your life um, over the course of you, you being a part of it. And I can think back to my first experience with the Rock Church. I come from like a smaller church back in Chicago. I'm not from here, but wifey is. So um, I, I, I married into this beautiful San Diego community and weather. I'm so You're grateful. <laughs> when we first started dating, we're like, hey, like Easter Sunday, where should we go? Um, and my, my wife was like, hey, let's go check out the Rock. And I was like, okay, sweet. And I was like, you know, just church, whatever, Easter Sunday. I came and like my mind was blown. Like not only was it blown, just like the excellence, excellence and quality of worship and everything, but I was like, this church is beautiful, it's diverse. Um, and so I remember also sitting there and being like, I could never see myself like working here or when up being a pastor. And then fast forward, here we are like 10 plus years later. Wow. And I would have never pictured like the path that God had me on to now be serving as like one of the pastors. And I remember coming here with my family. We have little kids now. And it just felt like home. And the, for the first time, and I know this might be sad, but like, as like a pastor, like, we felt like everybody in our family was like finally like connected. If mm -hmm. that makes sense, myself, wife, kids, um, and so that's one way that the Rock has impacted us and my family and myself. And um, I don't know if you guys have like a story recently or. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I, the, I mean, when I think about the Rock. The moment we were, my husband now, but at the time we were boyfriend and girlfriend, when, when we were first invited, I mean, I think everything changed. <laughs> like the whole trajectory of our yeah, life. Right? And yeah. we realized that there was a lot of things that we weren't necessarily doing. We knew of God, but mm -hmm. I don't think we had a relationship with him. Mm -hmm. And the first, similar to, holiday uh, weekend, hey, we were invited go. on Thanksgiving weekend. a great way weekend. to check it out. Yeah, a great way to come to the <laughs> Great time to come. Yeah. Um, yeah, immediately when I walked in, I love that you said the diversity of the place really mm -hmm. stood out to you because that really did catch my attention. And then there was this just feeling of uh, peace that mm. I never felt before. And, mm -hmm. you know, at the time, I really didn't understand what it was. Now I realize, obviously, it's the Holy Spirit. Yeah, man. But, Come um, on. Yeah, as soon as I heard that worship music, it was so different. I've, I was raised Catholic, and it was a very... Uh, traditional uh, right. <laughs> Catholic uh, parish that I used to attend. And so mm -hmm. it felt very different from anything I experienced. So, I mean, at first I was like, where am I? What am I doing? Yeah. We sat at literally like the furthest possible right. seat. That's where we sat when we were in Easter. The same thing, like yeah. third level, we like, like late. trying to check it out. Like. <laughs> yeah, so as soon as Pastor Miles was like, come to the altar, man, we had a long walk to go. <laughs> go take a minute. On the third floor. Yeah. But I was like, I'm going. Yeah. And then, uh, Keep those keys going. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> wow. I think 
I mean, this church has transformed my wife and I's life in so many ways, but yeah. one way that is maybe not as known is just the development I've been able to receive as a leader. Mm. Mm. So That's this good. is, oh, yeah. Same. I never wanted to be a pastor, you know, yeah. we kind of talk about that. Like I didn't, I think all three of us probably <laughs> yeah, right. saw ourselves. It's like we had a pre-idea uh, <laughs> yeah. of what was going to be mm -hmm. happening versus... I didn't see myself in this type of role, you know, leading people and um, the first role that I had here on staff was as our young adults pastor. And so being able to have people like Pastor Danny really mentor and develop me and round off a lot of the rough edges I had, like that was so vital. So to, God, you know, allowed us to move here and to be planted in a place, but then just kept like bringing in really a lot of like additional father figures into my life, which was so crucial mm -hmm. for my like, spiritual yeah. development. So I'm super grateful. But that all happened because we just kept saying yes to like what God yeah. had in, oh, in front okay. of us. So you don't have to be That's on good. staff That's so to good. be yeah. like so developed. Good, like yeah. you just have to continue to seek out be and be willing mm -hmm. to be shaped and discipled. That's, yeah. That was really key. Thanks for sharing, bro. That's good. All right, family. Well, hey, we know that you have stories just like ours, um, just how the house here has impacted your life. So a couple things you can do. Drop in the comment section below. Our team would love to just chat with you and hear and just God be praised for all that he's doing in your life here at The Rock. Or you can do a few things. You can text STORY to 52525 and share it that way or visit sdrock.com slash story. We're just compiling a bunch of stories of what God is doing so he can receive all the honor and all the mm -hmm. glory. A few other things before we head out. You want to stay up to date on all the things Rock Church and what's happening. You can follow us at all our social media platforms at The Rock San Diego. And one more thing, shout out to all the guys, all the men, what's up? I gotta do this. I'm registered, I don't know if you are, but hey, if you're in the area, or even if you're from afar, we would love for you to figure out a way to come to our men's conference. Um, if you want more information of how to register, visit ignitemensd.com, or you can text IGNITE to 52525. Once again, ignitemensd.com, or text IGNITE to 52525, register, and I'll see you there. All right, we'll see you next week.